Good morning and welcome to uh, this month's Downtown Aviation and Redevelopment Subcommittee. We begin uh, every subcommittee, well this particular subcommittee, with the call to public. And we end with the call to public, which is it's just a reminder that uh, the public gets the first and the last word. And uh, with that, uh, do we, ha we have no cards to open up with the call to public. We will have, we do have a couple cards that are sprinkled throughout the, uh, the agenda. Uh, the next item is the approval of the June 4th minutes. There is one, there's one correction in the packet on page five was item six, Central Station uh, Development Agreement. That was for information only. According to the minutes here, uh, there, was a, there was a vote. And, and so with that correction, do we have a, a motion and a second? Move approval. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Item four, Terminal three, modern modernization project update. Now this is for information. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. We are really excited. These are excited airport people sitting before you today. Um, so we're really excited to update you on the uh, Terminal 3 modernization uh, program. You'll probably recall that the City Council approved the Phoenix um, Sky Harbor International Airport Terminal Modernization Program on April 2nd of 2013, uh, following a unanimous approval of the Downtown Aviation and Redevelopment um, Subcommittee. On October 30th of that same year, the Council authorized a design-build contract with Hunt Austin Joint Venture to design and construct improvements to Terminal 3. That team has really been working very hard with the airport team um, and so later this month, we're going to be before the City Council requesting approval for the first phase of the um, construction um, and construction of the Terminal 3 um, modernization program and the enabling projects. So here today to do the fun, cool stuff is Assistant Aviation Director um, Tammy Fisher and Special, Special Projects Administrator Art Fairbanks, who are going to show you some renderings and talk about the concepts as we move forward with this very exciting project to make sure that Sky Harbor continues to be the world-class airport facility that the sixth largest city in the United States um, deserves. Ms. Fisher. Good morning, Mr. Chair, subcommittee members. Uh, we are indeed very excited to be here today to give you an update about the Terminal 3 modernization project. And we have been very busy with our design build team um, since they were selected um, to uh, work with us in October of last year. Um, today we have images to show you where we're going, but I thought we would start with this historic image. This is the architect's original rendering for Terminal 3 um, from the 1970s. And this is what an architect might call the bones of the building, um, the roots of our design. It was originally a grand hall space with lots of windows um, so that our customers could really get a first experience of the city of Phoenix and our region. Um, as they came to the airport. Um, these spaces really give a great impression and say a lot about who we are as a community. We are designing a new modern Terminal 3 uh, with those roots in mind. Our goals for the project are, of course, number one, to improve the experience of the traveling public. Um, we all know today's travel can produce some anxiety uh, that involves getting there on time, finding a parking space, getting through the checkpoint, uh, finding some food, something to drink, um, and then you can relax on your business trip or on your vacation. We want to make sure that we improve that experience and relieve that stress of travel for our customers. We also want the facility to be efficient to operate. And that doesn't, that means not only from an energy uh, standpoint, but also it needs to be efficient for our business partners and our concessionaires. This is their place of business and we want to make sure that they can be successful in the terminal environment. Um, we've committed to our business partners to undertake this program through incremental development. What that means is that we will build um, in small pieces. We need to do that anyway uh, to minimize disruption to the customer. And once we begin, if market dynamics should change, we would be able to stop the program or pause the program and reevaluate uh, the development program to meet current market conditions. Uh, 
um, this is a very complex project. Um, you could think of this project as building a terminal inside of a terminal with about 5 million passengers a year visiting the job site. Um, so we have to be very careful to um, properly phase construction of this major project to minimize disruptions. Um, in the end, our goal is to um, complete the improvements to Terminal 3 and retire Terminal 2 for airline operations. As we mentioned, we um, presented the planning study, in the, which was really an idea, a concept, a business case for the project. And thank you for your support in approving that so that we could move forward. We selected our design build team, Hunt Austin Joint Venture. Uh, the design partners on the project are Smith Group, DWL, and Corgan. Um, we have completed a pre-design phase, or what we call a project definition phase. And what that does is really sets the overall scope of the project, the schedule, and the budget. It also starts to look at, or starts to delineate the look and feel of the project. And you'll see some images of the future project um, that Mr. Fairbanks will show you. These are still pre preliminary and um, in progress. We think it's very important to keep our airline business partners engaged. After all, this is their place of business. And if the terminal doesn't work efficiently for them, uh, we, we will have a difficult time being successful at the airport. Uh, we have contracted with what's called an airline technical representative. And the role of this uh, person on, is to really join the project team. Be sure to represent the airline interests um, as we move forward in the design to be sure that the building functions properly for their operations. And this person is also responsible for communicating back to the airlines who are sometimes all over the country visiting different airports to keep them engaged and keep them informed about how the, pro the project is uh, progressing. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Art Fairbanks. He is our Special Projects Administrator, and he is responsible for uh, leading the design build team and coordinating the many stakeholders involved in this project. Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be with you here today to talk about <laughs> Terminal 3, past, present, and future. And so when we hired the Hunt-Austin Joint Venture team, we talked about some design emphasis of the program. Uh, one of those design, important design emphases was to have a LEED Silver certified building upon completion. And this project is focused on a value-based approach to make sure that when we do construction, we provide a world-class terminal for our customers uh, in a responsible cost climate for them. We've also challenged the designer to take a fresh look from the planning study to see how they can integrate different parts of the program to make this a better terminal for our customers and add value to the project. This solutions-based design really harnesses that relationship between the builder, uh, the owner, and the designer to make sure we have a terminal that works for all of our customers. Some of the aesthetic considerations we worked with the uh, uh, contractor on is to take a look at Terminal 3 from the, the point of view from our Valley assets. Uh, terminal 3 has some unique opportunities. And we're all aware that Phoenix has over 300 days of sunshine annually. There's an opportunity here to feature the famous Arizona sunsets and blue sky in a way other cities can't. The Sky Harbor is unique in its proximity to the downtown business center. And it's important to reinforce this link in the design. This will allow business meetings to take place easily. And it's also a competitive advantage for the city. We all know that the modern travel experience can be anxiety producing. Part of the design of the terminals will be to take advantage of intuitive wayfinding uh, to make sure we can assist travelers as they navigate through the airport. And again, as Tammy mentioned, one of the important things is to enhance that traveling experience for all of the customers that use the terminal. And one of the images up on the screen is an image of Terminal 3 that shows the terminal design uh, as it is today. And it was constructed in 1979. At the time, it was considered innovative architecture for the 1970s. The design was a brutalism style of heavy concrete and narrow windows. And the terminal has relatively low ceilings on each floor. The hold rooms are undersized for today's aircraft. And the layout of the building is not really conducive for attractive concession opportunities. That's something we can deliver in the future. There is a way to modernize this terminal in a way that honors the original design and also addresses its intent for the necessity of today's traveler. And so this slide shows the team's vision for Terminal 3. Immediately apparent is the use of glass, which will allow passengers to see out and allow natural light in. 
to ensure that the building is energy efficient, a sophisticated thermal analysis uh, is conducted to understand these surfaces and to treat them with a mixture of overhead shade, high efficiency glass, and vertical window coverings. This building will let light in while actively counteracting heat gain. And the team is exploring opportunities for solar generation on the site as well. And one of the things we want to note is the transparency through the building, which provides natural views of Camelback Mountain, Piestua Peak, South Mountain, and downtown Phoenix. And one thing to note is we show additional rendered images from the team. It's important to note these are conceptual renderings, and they're really meant to uh, demonstrate spatial relationships in the building. And so over time, the colors or space may change a little bit, but it's meant to show the intent of the building as it's designed. And here we see an overview and aerial of the new Terminal 3 design. And the terminal modernization project is separated into three components. Uh, the first component, shown here in red at the center of the screen, represents the main terminal and will be the first to be constructed. Major features of the main terminal include new ticket counters, upgraded baggage carousels, increased concession offerings, and new, a new security checkpoint. And we expect the project to start in earnest after the Super Bowl in March of 2015. Additional components to the program here shown in green at the top of the page is a north concourse. This concourse will receive new concession opportunities and a totally remodeled concourse with amenities for today's passenger. And another significant component pictured here in yellow on the bottom of the page uh, is the new south concourse, which will add nine gates. This concourse will allow the airport to consolidate operations from other terminals and lower not only operational costs, but capital costs for maintaining these facilities. And so I want to take an opportunity here to focus on the first component, the main terminal. It's our first focus area. And work in the main terminal will require up to four distinct phases in the program. And the main passenger functions will need to be available for use of the, all the passengers during the construction period. The ticketing security checkpoint and baggage handling systems as well will need to be maintained, as well as maintaining access to the parking garages and curbs throughout this phase. On the screen is a two-dimensional floor plan that's useful for understanding flow through this building. A passenger entering the, turb, uh, entering the terminal from either the curb or the parking areas will enter the ticketing area on the left-hand side of the screen on the bottom uh, floor plan, street level. Customers from the Phoenix SkyTrain will traverse down one level from the checkpoint, streamlining their travel into the checkpoint. Customers will transition into the service level of the main terminal where they will encounter an a consolidated checkpoint. And upon clearing, clearing the security checkpoint, the customer will exp experience a gracious recomposure area. And I'll be able to show that in the slide here. Here's a three-dimensional image of how the terminal will look uh, in the main terminal point of view. The image represents a conceptual cutaway of the main terminal. And the graphic depicts uh, the new circulation of Terminal 3 in the three-dimensional model. And notice the circulation passed from ticketing level to the checkpoint Mr. Chair, and also question. the Great Hall. Mr. Fairbanks, so um, am I understanding then if you, let's so if you're parking on the, if you're parking in the garage, do you have to go down to the first level and then go up through security or will you be able to, or like if you're on the third level, will you, will you go down to security then? How will that work? Mr. Chair, uh, Councilman Gates, uh, if parking in the garage, you may enter through that, uh, through the garage S, uh, elevators down to that first level. You'll traverse across that first level through ticketing, up the escalator and into the checkpoint. Likewise, our, Sky Heart, our SkyTrain customers will ride from the SkyTrain down one level into that consolidated okay, checkpoint. Okay, so like now, I mean, you can just park on whatever level the, you know, security is and you just walk right in. You'll now be sort of forced down to the first level. Is, is yeah, that how so, that's going to so work now? So now we're asking our customers to go to that first level okay. to circulate through the building into that consolidated checkpoint. And, and Mr. Chair and Councilman Gates, the purpose of that really is so that the customers will have a much better experience. So you'll see in this, and I think uh, Mr. Framix is going to show you another slide in a moment about the consolidated checkpoints. So as the terminal works today, there are checkpoints over on the north side and the south side. And if you're going to the north concourse, once you go through security, you're there. You, you either have to exit security and be rescreened. This is to provide 12 consolidated security checkpoint lanes so that the customers will have a much better experience. Um, there's a recomposure area I think Mr. Fairbanks is going to talk about in a moment so that once you go through, you can sit down, relax, put your belts back on and your shoes and, uh, and, and those sort of things. Um, and it's really meant to improve the experience uh, of navigating through, through the building. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, this image may be useful in explaining how people circulate through the building as well. Off to the left of this image is the ticketing area, and that's the escalator to that checkpoint. At the top is the Phoenix Sky Train, where you come down one level. Uh, some of the features of the space is off to the right, you'll see the uh, downtown Phoenix, and as you travel up the escalator, you can see the Sky Train, and that's part of that intuitive wayfinding the team has worked for. And this is the uh, example of the recomposure area Mr. Murphy was speaking about. Uh, this is the recomposure area that you'll experience immediately following the TSA checkpoint. And you have an opportunity to contrast that experience to other airports that you may be through in terms of the checkpoint. Many others are crowded, have low ceilings, and make the sometimes unpleasant task of going through the checkpoint even harder. Uh, I describe this as an area where you can clear Mr. checkpoint Chair, and feel Mr. Mr. Fairbank, sorry. Please. So uh, just. It, it sounds like we're going to be using the elevators a lot more than we are now. If everybody has to go down, who are parking at higher levels, is that fair? Are we going to upgrade the, the elevator capacity? Or? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilman Gates, right now all passengers really enter either on the first floor or on the second floor. And so we have a significant bank of elevators on the east side. We will also have new elevators on the west side. And the majority of the customers coming into the building are, are arriving from the curbs or on the SkyTrain. We do expect um, SkyTrain usage to increase as the SkyTrain connects to all terminals as well as our largest economy parking facility. So there will be more elevators added into the building um, on both ends as well as some elevators for business operations, oversized bags to be brought up to the service level. Great, thanks. Uh, in this image, in this conceptual rendered view, we're displaying the great hall of this passenger level. So this is the area that you enter up to, up from the escalator in the main terminal building. And this image uh, here shows the arrival hall for passengers. Note the expansive space that will visit, uh, will greet visitors to Phoenix. Uh, in a future phase of the project, the existing South Concourse will be raised and a new 15 gate concourse built in its place. Uh, and this concourse will have the opportunity to provide passengers that modern conveniences uh, and the needed capacity to consolidate operations from Terminal 2. And this slide shows a floor plan, a sample floor plan, and there's a lot of detail on the slide, but uh, you can uh, look at the slide and imagine the spaces in blue, uh, which would be airline gate spaces, uh, purple, which would be concession opportunities, and circulation routes in tan on the image. The North Concourse, shown here in green, uh, will be renovated. Will also be renovated to add additional customer amenities, uh, dining options, and modern infrastructure to make the terminal more energy efficient and more welcoming for our customers. A concession note envisioned here in this image in Terminal Three Northside will provide natural light and views to the outdoors. The enhanced offerings will help to generate revenue, which is used to maintain Sky Harbor. Uh, because of the dynamic na nature of the airline business, the Aviation Department is taking a conservative, incremental approach with regard to commissioning of individual components of the program. Uh, the slide depicts one of the possible uh, scenarios on the timeline here. Uh, in the above scenario, construction for terminal modernization is scheduled to begin in earnest immediately following Super Bowl 49. Uh, upon delivery of the first phase of the component, the aviation team will make a decision on how best to proceed with the program. Uh, the Aviation Department is committed to maintaining the effectiveness of Phoenix Sky Harbor. This economic engine feeds tourism throughout the state. The budget for the entire terminal modernization pro project is $590 million and will be committed based on the incremental development approvals mentioned in the previous slide. It's important to note for the record that funding for this project is part of an enterprise fund and is funded by airport revenue. As a result, only the people who use the airport pay for its services and funding for this capital project does not compete with important city services like fire, police, parks, and libraries. In order to efficiently modernize Terminal 3, it'll be necessary to complete some modifications uh, in advance for sequencing of the work. Uh, to create these areas, it'll be necessary to move some airline activity to Terminal 2. Additionally, in order to cre create an efficient terminal and to better serve customers, we will have to move aviation employees out of offices in Terminal 3 into a newly constructed office on airport property west of Terminal 2. Later this month, we will request Phoenix City Council authority to authorize enabling work and order long lead items such as steel, elevators, and escalators. Uh, for next steps, the Aviation Department will complete the schematic design 
uh, funding will be requested to complete the design to 100% on the main terminal building. Later in the month, the Aviation Department will request council approval for $103 million for a series of guaranteed maximum price proposals to begin enabling work, relocate aviation staff, order long lead items, establish phasing, and begin some construction on the main terminal. Uh, the City of Phoenix Streets and Transportation Department has recommended a small business enterprise aspirational goal of 20% participation in the project. The Hunt Austin Joint Venture has expressed confidence they can meet or exceed this target. And we will be back to update the, the, uh, this committee and the Phoenix City Council as major milestones are achieved and projects are, the project meets its goal of enhancing travel experience for all the customers. And so, Mr. Chair, members of the uh, Downtown Aviation Redevelopment Subcommittee, I was presented today for information, and I would be happy to welcome any questions or comments. Any questions or comments by my councilwoman? Will any of the construction staging be near residential areas? The impacts on people who live near the airport? M uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Gallego, uh, the construction will take place entirely within the Terminal 3 envelope adjacent to the terminal. Uh, so all of the, even the lay down areas, construction sites on airport property away from neighborhoods. Thank you. Okay. Councilwoman. Thank you. If, if I were going to meet somebody coming in, would I have to be on first floor or second floor? I mean, I, I didn't see spacing for seating or anything. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Williams, it, uh, there are meet and greet areas on the passenger level, just as you exit uh, on the passenger level, mm -hmm. through that uh, airside mm -hmm. space in that concession area, there's a meet and greet level on that floor. There's an, also an additional opportunity at the baggage claim area where you can meet your customers. So there's a couple of opportunities to meet there. Also enhancing that area is some more of that glass. We'll have an opportunity to meet customers with a view of the uh, natural landmarks here in Phoenix, Camelback and Fiesta Peak. And are background. concessions close by so anybody waiting could partake of shopping or eating? Uh, so Mr. Chair, uh, Councilwoman Williams, indeed there will be uh, concessions both land side and air side, so <laughs> opportunities throughout the building. Thank you. Mr. Chair and, and um, Councilwoman Williams, part, part of this is as we redevelop Terminal 3, uh, Ms. Fisher and her team are also working on a new food and beverage package for this um, great new um, terminal, and so we'll be coming back to you in the future to ensure that the concessions in Terminal 3 are equal to or better than the concessions that are in Terminal 4. We commit to you that they will be just as good, if, if not better, um, as we come back to you. And that they are located, this part of this enhanced space is allowing us to have more concessions, uh, more revenue producing opportunities, and more opportunities for small businesses in the airport as we move forward with this, um, with this program as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the $590 million, does that include, because I know you, you kind of touched on ramping down Terminal 2, does that include any cost for the demolition of, of Terminal 2? Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Councilman Gates, ter at this time Terminal 2 is will remain standing at the end of the project, so it, it is not in the scope of the project. So it, essentially it's the Terminal 3 work. Essentially, is that that number? Okay, and just to <clears throat> jump a little ahead, I've, and I've been asked this question in the community because again, we're talking 2020 on Terminal Two, which really is not that far away in the big scheme mm -hmm. of things. Any plans at this point on what to be done with those parking lots that are near the West Economy? I've got some some folks that uh, are big fans of those lots, and they're curious about what might be happening with those in the future. And Mr. Chair, Councilman Gates, we will keep those parking facilities operating even after we're completed with the Terminal 3 program. At this point, all of those parking facilities on the west side will continue to be used. And is, are there thoughts for, I mean, so like the way things are set now with, with the SkyTrain, they would have to walk. They'd have a bit of a walk, but they could walk over to the uh, Terminal 3 um, the Terminal 3 Sky Train station and then go over to Terminal 4? Right. We're, uh, Councilman Gates, we are looking at different ways of incorporating those parking facilities into the parking program, um, offer new levels of service to our passengers, and that may include, you know, a lower price for a little bit of a walk or a uh, different price for a very speedy SkyTrain connection to the other terminals, but we will continue to incorporate that into our parking program. 
And I was very pleased to see that um, the building will be LEED certified. Is that just the main terminal building, or, or is that the concourses as well? That will be the entire project. And then one, one final question. On the south concourse, why is it oriented to the west as opposed to coming straight south like the north concourse? Just curious. The, um, that, uh, Mr. Chair, Councilman Gates, that uh, is what we call a linear concourse. It is um, a more modern configuration for terminal design for airports. Um, it is more operationally efficient for the airlines. Um, in Terminal 4, one of the um, less desirable qualities of the pier, what we call the pier configuration, is that transitional space that the customer moves through those connector bridges. There's no amenities there. So in a linear concourse, you have the gates on one side, and then you have shopping and restrooms and other amenities, you know, art exhibits all along the way. So as you're moving down the concourse, you're getting a lot more amenities offered to the passenger, which improves revenues, and it's much more efficient um, for the airlines. The passengers typically like to be as close to the gate as possible before they um, start dining or shopping. And, and Mr. Chairman and Mr. Uh, Mr. Gates, if I might also add, uh, Mr. Makovsky would be very happy that you asked that question because in addition to that, it is also better utilization of the airfield itself, the, the linear design is a much better operational aspect from the use of the airfield and the way the aircraft will use that um, and something that benefits, again, the, the airfield piece of that substantially. Great. Thank you. Councilwoman? Could you talk about some of the green features, uh, particularly on waste management and energy management? Mr. Chair, Ms. Cagle, we, uh, we did mention the LEED cert certified uh, capability in the project, but we're also working on looking at where can we integrate solar into the project as well as uh, starting, you know, it's, it's really an uh, opportunity for us to take a look at how the whole building operates, how can we harness some recycling and meet some of the city's goals on recycling, starting with a, a fresh pallet, a, a clean slate to make sure that we build the systems in place now to harness that to do a better job recycling. We've met a number of our recycling goals, but this is an opportunity to start with the end in mind to create a building that works well and, and uh, is a green building for our customers. Wonderful. And it would be great news if we can exceed LEED Silver. Well, this is for information only. I appreciate it. It's all very exciting. Some great questions and comments coming from the, the, the subcommittee. Um, this is about the customer. It's about being efficient and uh, giving uh, customers exactly what they want. Terminal 4, I think if anyone uh, who does any traveling, I think it's probably, probably mo most of the people anyway. I think there was a survey that uh, quite a few people uh, in, in every neighborhood in the city uh, has, has been uh, at the airport for whatever reason. Most of the time it's in Terminal 4, and if we can get some of that going with the rest of the terminals, I think we'd be in good shape, and this is what this project is all about. So I'm very excited about it. Um, uh, in addition to all the, the great information that was just talked about, in the immediate future, how many jobs are we talking about? What does this mean for our immediate uh, economy. I don't know that we have a precise calculation of new jobs, and we can definitely get that for you, Mr. Chair. Um, this project will progress incrementally, so we probably would need to calculate that for each um, stage mm -hmm. of the program, as well as the new um, concessions opportunities. Uh, we will be contracting for the entire concessions program at some point during this process, and we know from Terminal 4 that that um, increased jobs, new concessions created more jobs. I think there's probably a 30, 40 percent increase in the number of jobs in Terminal 4, just rebidding our Terminal 4 food and beverage concession. Mm -hmm. So I apologize, we don't have those exact numbers for you. I would uh, say it will produce a significant number of jobs, uh, but we can definitely try to forecast that and calculate that for you. Yeah, I would appreciate that. I think it's important. And uh, might want to forecast where the Terminal 3 fit Phoenix walking trail may be as well. <laughs> uh, post security, we'll have a much bigger trail for you yeah. in Terminal 3. And a dog park. And, and a dog park. Uh -huh. that's, yeah. that's a very good point. Absolutely. Very good point. Okay, again, this was for information only, and appreciate you, uh, you coming out and, sh and uh, 
keeping us up to speed on it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item five. Get to keep Danny here with us. Request to award contract for shared ride van <coughs> service at Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and subcommittee members. Um, we are here to, um, to request your recommendation to the council to award a contract for the shared ride van service at Sky Harbor International Airport to Super Shuttle Arizona Incorporated and Assistant Director, um, uh, Aviation Director Chad Makovsky and Deputy Aviation Director Steve Krubbs are here to provide you with some information and that recommendation. Mr. Makovsky. Chairman Valenzuela, members of the subcommittee, happy to be here today. In fact, uh, Mr. Murphy mentioned that he was very happy to have staff here to talk about terminal modernization. I would argue we are equally as happy, perhaps even happier, uh, to talk about, uh, after significant staff work, to talk about the award recommendation for shared ride van services today. Uh, just as a reminder, shared ride van services, by way of definition, really is a service that provides door-to-door -door, uh, transportation service for multiple parties to multiple directions or multiple destinations. The parties may or may not know each other, uh, but are generally traveling in the same direction at a fare that is uh, more economical than if they were to travel alone. <clears throat> uh, the service area under this contract covers a 35-mile uh, radius from Phoenix, as you can see in the map. Uh, passengers wishing to travel beyond the 35-mile radius uh, may either travel with an inner city operator, which we have those at the airport, or they may negotiate a rate with any of our permitted ground transportation providers. Uh, and of course, at a dynamic large hub airport such as Phoenix Sky Harbor, as you might imagine, we require the service to be available to our customers on a 24-7 basis. In fact, the incumbent uh, Super Shuttle had over 200,000 trips last year alone at Phoenix Sky Harbor, so that gives you some sense of, of how busy this operation really is. So by way of uh, some background, service is uh, currently provided by Super Shuttle. They've been under contract with the city of Phoenix since 2003. As you may recall, we previously issued an RFP and brought an award recommendation to the council in late uh, 2011. However, after considerable discussion amongst uh, the council members, uh, the award was ultimately rejected and council gave staff some great direction on how to move forward with a new RFP that placed emphasis on the experience of established companies in the industry. And since that time, staff has really done some, uh, some good work to develop a process that really met the goals uh, set by the city council at that time. Uh, it's important that you know, though, that shared ride van service has been <clears throat> uninterrupted during this time, uh, as the incumbent Super Shuttle has been operating on a month-to-month -month, uh, contract until the new contract has been, is ultimately will be awarded. And so at this time, I'd like to ask Deputy Aviation Director, Mr. Steve Grubbs, to discuss the RFP process that we developed and the results that have led to our award recommendation today. Steve. Thank you, Chad. Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, you may remember late last year, we came before the DAR and City Council requesting permission to reissue this RFP for shared ride van service. And as you can see, we, we set our minimum qualifications. We also have a minimum annual contract fee of 550,000. And you can see the evaluation criteria that is emphasizing the, the companies and their experience for this process. A few other RFP highlights here. I'd like to point out a, a couple new vehicle requirements. Um, for the permanent fleet for this, this service, we're going to see 75% 2014 or newer vehicles and 25% uh, no older than 2011 vehicles. And at no time during the contract can a vehicle be over five years old. The, the, the next one, alternative fuel requirements, that is a requirement in, in the contract and, and th that was a requirement uh, passed by council or consistent with council's guidance a number of years ago for alternative fuel. Um, something new in the contract is electronic credit card processing. So customers that, that don't make arrangements uh, ahead of time, prearranged, can, can pay their, their fare uh, through an electronic device in the vehicle. Uh, that, so that is new from, from the existing service provided today. And you can see a few of the other highlights as well. Outreach and, and participation. Uh, we, we perform significant outreach both nationally, uh, also regionally and locally. To, to companies to, to bid on this service. Uh, we we uh, held a pre-proposal meeting where we had eight companies show interest and participate in that pre-proposal meeting. Uh, of the eight, three companies did bid on, on this RFP. Uh, two companies, two out of the three, uh, were, were deemed non-responsive and were disqualified from, from the, the RFP process. Uh, one company did protest. 
Uh, the aviation department did answer that, that company, uh, respond back, and reaffirm that they, they did not meet the minimum qualifications or requirements of the RFP process. So Super Shuttle, they did meet all the requirements and minimum qualifications. We did post uh, online um, in the middle of May that Super Shuttle uh, was the recommended proposer. At that time, no appeal was, was filed uh, for posting the recommended proposer of Super Shuttle. So at this time, I, I would like to, to say that the Super Shuttle is our recommended proposer, Super Shuttle uh, Arizona Incorporated. And I would like to acknowledge the management team that's here today. Um, behind me, you, you'll see John Seacrest, the Regional Vice President of Super Shuttle Arizona Incorporated, and also Alan Gildersleeve, the General Manager, who's our General Manager today and who would be our General Manager in the future uh, for, for this service moving forward. Contract terms, this is a five-year contract term with one five-year renewal option. Under the RFP, we require at least 40% owner-operator or franchisee opportunities, and Super Shuttle does offer 100% uh, franchisee opportunities for their drivers at this time. Uh, annual permit fee, it's above, slightly above the minimum that, that we requested in the RFP process. And uh, a trip fee, and that's a newly added trip fee of $3 per trip. And uh, at 200,000 trips, that's a, just uh, approximately $600,000 for a total revenue of just over $1.1 million, and that's significantly higher than uh, revenue generation that, than that we are generating today under the existing contract. Now that $1.1 million goes a long way in providing super shuttle exclusivity curb space to, to provide the shared ride van service, and it also helps offset our costs, whether it be staffing, roadway work, uh, signage, and other miscellaneous costs that we have to run the, run the airport and enforce our rules. Maximum passenger fares that were bid by Super Shuttle uh, are very reasonable, and you can see the, the different fares for the different radiuses around the airport. And to give you a little context, back in 2003, we didn't quite uh, show it this way or ask for it this way in that contract and back then, but we did ask for a maximum fare at the 35-mile radius. And uh, back in 2003, the maximum fare is $44, so a few dollars higher than the maximum fare uh, that they've bid on today. And, I do want to reinforce that these are maximum fares uh, throughout the entire terms of the contract that they can that uh, Super Shuttle would be able to charge their their customers. So we measure success through this RFP with an experienced company and an experienced general manager providing this service. Uh, today, Super Shuttle has a fleet of 90 vans out there and very sophisticated reservation system providing sir service 24-7, 365. Uh, we, we expect and will continue to monitor a high level of service and, as you've seen, reasonable passenger fares. And I, I want, want to also acknowledge uh, Super Shuttle, who's been at the airport since the, the 1980s. They've, uh, they've been a great partner uh, with the City of Phoenix uh, Aviation Department and really are a model ground transportation provider at, at the airport. And, uh, and so we're happy to to, to welcome them aboard uh, on this, this new contract. So, so with that, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, I'd like to ask for your recommendation to the Phoenix City Council to award this contract of shared ride van service to Super Shuttle Arizona Incorporated. And we look forward to, uh, to this partnership and uh, seeing as many newer vehicles on the road before uh, Super Bowl 2015. Thank you. Any uh, thoughts or questions? Yeah. I, I, want, I want to thank you. Um, I know when we went through this exercise previously, it uh, uh, become a little rambunctious uh, by the time it got to council. And, putting it politely. <laughs> uh, and I am delighted that uh, the way you handled it this time. And I think it also uh, really shows the quality of Super Shuttle to have eight come to the pre-conference, uh, three come in, two disqualified because they didn't meet the standard, and Super Shuttle continued to shine through this and provide reasonable rates, new vehicles, and I think it's a great partnership for the city. So I thank you for all the hard work. I know we made you go through this exercise twice, 
Uh, but I think this shows the value of doing it, and I just appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chair and um, Councilwoman, if I might add as well, thank you for, um, for the direction that you provided for us as we came back to the Council. I think your clear direction on what you wanted for the City of Phoenix and for Sky Harbor really helped um, with the success, this su successful um, outcome, and so we appreciate your support and direction as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would echo everything uh, that Councilman Williams said. In addition, uh, very significant increase in the revenue that's going to be coming in uh, to the, the airport as a result of this. So. Obviously, we've got big plans ahead. We just talked about a very significant uh, project and uh, other modernization projects across the airport. So this revenue is going to make a big difference. And, and I appreciate you being able to, able to achieve that with a very small increase in the, the fares for the customers. So thank you. I, too, would like to thank you. And uh, I, I learned a lot as a council member. Those are the ones that teach you. <laughs> quite, quite a bit, but fortunately, we have our city staff where, you know, just the integrity that, that is prevalent and, and obvious and, uh, and everything that you do. So we, I appreciate that. So um, any other thoughts or questions? I know we, we talked about this initially right before Councilman Gallego uh, joined us. But, um, uh, but yes, things got less rambunctious after we got two new council people. <laughs> <laughs> You knew council women. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> we'll take credit. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, I don't know, Councilwoman Williams has kept this in line for quite some time. Wait, but, uh, but I needed help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so with that, I'm not going to argue. That's <laughs> what, <laughs> wise man. He did learn. <laughs> yeah, I see Claude Maddox over there just nodding his head. Yes, yeah. just be quiet. Just, yeah. <laughs> Actually, Mr. Chair, I would make uh, the motion to yeah. recommend approval to the council. Second. Right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, committee members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Item six, RFP for city property at uh, 206 East Portland Street. Mr. Chair uh, and subcommittee members, as is consistent with our practice and particularly in downtown redevelopment projects, we often come to you to share with you uh, the evaluation criteria before we start the process and we're here to do that as well this time to affirm um, that we are meeting both your and the community's objectives for uh, the outcomes of redevelopment. So with that, I'll introduce Ms. Mackey. Good morning, Chairman Valenzuela and subcommittee members. We're here today to request your approval uh, to issue an RFP for city-owned property in the Evans-Churchill neighborhood here in downtown. And here to present this item is CED Deputy Director Scott Sumners. Great. Thank you, Ms. Mackey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, subcommittee members, before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge a few folks who are in the uh, audience today who've been instrumental in helping us get community feedback, which is very important as part of this process. So Leslie Lindo is with uh, the uh, Roosevelt neighborhood uh, back here, and uh, Jim McPherson with the Evans Churchill has been very helpful as well. So thanks very much to them and to the entire associations for all the outreach they've helped us with. Uh, the city has owned this property since 2011. In 2004, uh, the city acquired uh, the, the property uh, after a development agreement was approved. And a, a developer actually started construction on the site in 2007. Uh, that was a, at a real difficult economic time, and they started started and stopped almost immediately after. Um, so they had put up the foundations and the utilities that exist on the site right now. Uh, and, and they actually failed to perform on the development agreement, and the city got the property back through a, a long process in 2011. So we've had the property since 2011. And earlier this year, we were approached by a couple developers who are very interested in developing the site. So consistent with the council direction to dispose of excess property and development interest, we're here today to request your approval. Uh, the site's located at the northeast corner of First, sorry, of Second Street and Portland. Um, it is approximately 9,000 square feet, uh, about two tenths of an acre, um, and it's fenced and vacant right now. 
uh, the, the location of the site is pretty fantastic. It's two blocks away from the light rail station. It's one block away from Hans, uh, from Hans Park to the north. Uh, the historic Sarah Pemberton house and a lot of vacant property are immediately north of the property. And then over to the east, uh, there's a few residential properties, uh, an apartment, a uh, small apartment house, and a single family home. Uh, to the south across Portland Street is a Reflections on Portland, a housing property. It's uh, affordable housing. And uh, this property um, very significantly is in the Roosevelt Row Entertainment uh, and Arts District. Uh, we solicited feedback from the community over the past few months uh, in collaboration with Downtown Phoenix, Inc. Um, so Downtown Phoenix, Inc. sent out a, a broadcast email. We actually met with uh, Roosevelt Neighborhood on August 4th met with Evans Churchill on the 13th of last month, and Evans Churchill sent out Facebook posts and broadcast emails and got lots of feedback, lots of very helpful feedback. Uh, and they've provided us with a summary of the feedback and a letter summarizing uh, what their recommendations would be for the RFP. Uh, the ideas that have come up so far uh, range very, very widely, from affordable housing to very high-end housing, from uh, put anything on the site except for parking to we really need district parking on the site. So it's not surprising there's a number of opinions out there uh, in the community. Uh, there's also ideas for a corner store, a restaurant, a park, a garden, those kinds of things. Uh, we went back to Roosevelt neighborhood last night actually um, and got additional feedback and got some feedback from the Hans Park Conservancy uh, who is very much advocating for residential and ownership residential specifically. Uh, and this will continue. We plan to go back to the Evans Churchill neighborhood on the 10th of this month and then go to the Roosevelt Row Merchants Association and speak with them at their meeting on the 15th. The proposed evaluation criteria are on the screen here and uh, they are typically what we include in these uh, RFPs but they're adjusted just like each one is to, rec uh, to reflect the unique requirements of this site. So specifically in, in this one, the highest points are allocated to qualifications uh, and, and the fact that we really are looking for a developer with a proven track record who's done this, this kind of development before. And the other highest point uh, is allocated right now in a proposed uh, uh, points to economic and community benefit uh, because both financial return to the city is important uh, as well as community benefit. And I think what's uh, been acknowledged several times is uh, there's a dearth of parking in the area and uh, whatever project is uh, uh, built here should provide their own parking so as to not exacerbate the problem further. We have not formed the evaluation panel yet, but we plan to include both community representatives and city staff as we have on several other uh, solicitations. Uh, this is in the Evans Churchill neighborhood, so we would most likely include an Evans Churchill representative. Um, and we've also included Downtown Phoenix Inc. Uh, or Downtown Phoenix Partnership representatives on the panel in the past. And then there's also several city departments that have uh, a stake in, in this property by virtue of uh, ownership, by virtue of uh, property across the street, Hans Park being nearby. Um, so we would look at those as well. From a timing standpoint, uh, we plan on issuing the RFP late this year. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we met with the neighborhoods uh, last month and we're continuing to meet this month. Uh, and pending approval today, uh, we would order an appraisal um, and that should allow us to be able to post the appraisal when we actually post the RFP so all the prospective proposers would have access to that information. Uh, we plan to bring this to the City Council uh, on October 1st if the subcommittee is so inclined. And assuming we put out the RFP for 60 days, uh, proposals would be due in early 2015. That's all the detail we have today. The recommendation uh, is for the subcommittee to recommend city council approval to issue the RFP using the criteria and the points as discussed today. And with that, happy to answer any questions. Questions? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. First of all, uh, another great project. Um, Great to see that you're activating, working to activate more city-owned property to generate revenue, um, both for the city and more development um, for, for our community in general. Any, but as I look at this, there's not going to be any preference towards what type of development this will be. I mean, I don't see anything here in the, um, uh, in the RFP and the, the, the criteria that you'll be looking at, so it's really open, thinking it will probably be residential, but 
not necessarily stating that it has to be any particular type of development? Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gates, uh, just in response there, we are continuing to gather input. Um, we are, are looking at this point to try to finalize what the, what the criteria are and what the points are, but we'll continue to gather input and whatever uh, preference or um, recommendations the neighborhoods would have would probably be included along with the solicitation. So what we've seen so far is a, a letter from Evans Churchill that responds to their constituency that, uh, that really likes all different kinds of things. Uh, the, the one that is um, most commonly mentioned is residential. Um, and I think that's reflected in the Evans Churchill letter, but we could easily include that letter and if we get a letter also from the Roosevelt neighborhood, we could include that as part of the RFP process. So any prospective proposers would know uh, what the neighborhood's looking for. Yeah, I get, Mr. Chair, I guess my concern is just if we have a commercial development and a residential development and under these criteria they're kind of equal, mm -hmm. then, you know, how, how, are, how are we going to decide it's, um, you know, or almost feel like maybe there needs to be some, and maybe it's not until we get to the council level, since there's still meetings here, but maybe some indication from the council that, you know, there's 50 points for one over the other, you know, depending upon whether the preference, and it kind of sounds like it's residential, but um, I, I think that might be something that we want to look at throughout the process here. Uh, and, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilman Gates, uh, we can clearly, before we get to council, um, the intention is to try and have collected together a notion of what the what appears to be a con, um, to the degree possible a consensus of the community. We'd be pleased to come back and visit with the subcommittee members individually, get your feedback before we make a final recommendation to council about criteria. Great, and Mr. Chair, just one more thing. I just wanted to take the opportunity to welcome uh, Ms. Mackey. We're very excited to have you here. Heard lots of great things about you from the East Valley and uh, just, just want to say welcome. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Yeah, Councilman. I will join Councilman Gates in, in welcoming you. I have gotten to know your work in Chandler through my work outside of the City Council and you have a very impressive winning record so we look forward to having that in Phoenix. We have a lot of folks who are still struggling to recover from the recession and it will be great as we can move forward and strengthening our economy. So very glad to have you here. Thank you, Councilwoman. Looking forward to working with an amazing staff and a, a great city. Excited for the wins here. We definitely have a lot of good resources to work with, so it will be exciting. Um, I represent a district a few blocks away from this one and have heard from uh, folks in my district that they would really like us. We're giving points to uh, consistency with approved city plans and ordinances. And we hear over and over again transit-oriented design, which is obviously a perfect match for this site, so close to light rail. And then the shade and, shade and tree master plan, which similarly will help create a more walkable, vibrant downtown, keep people out and about and celebrating our downtown. So thank you for including approved city plans and ordinances. And to the extent those in particular can be called out, would appreciate that. Absolutely. Great. Uh, I'm, and I apologize to my colleagues I probably should have gone to the cards first uh, but I'll do that now I have F3 cards who do not wish to speak but are in favor Jim McPherson uh, Evans Churchill Community Association uh, Leslie Lindo Hi, Leslie and uh, Brent Brent what's your last name Lennon camp uh, I, was, I almost introduced you as Dr. Brent Lynn. I, the handwriting. So. <laughs> no, my handwriting is pretty bad. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for being here, Brent. Uh, all Mark in favor, do not wish to speak, correct? Okay. Now, we do have two cards, two individuals who'd like to, to come up at the same time, uh, Sherry McCracken and Rebecca Pringle. Both mark in favor. Um, she, you can, you're welcome to have a seat here. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Can you turn your mic on? Sorry. <laughs> I'm now on the recorder. Good morning. I'm Sherry McCracken. I represent the historic Pemberton House, which if you remember that slide, there's one house in the middle of two blocks of dirt. That's ours. It was built in 1920. 
by the then widow of the former CEO of, oh, thank you, <laughs> of um, APS. We have been approached by a developer to move the house and to keep it historic. We have been working on this project for about two years. Um, we originally, and have all the prints in place to turn it into a law office with residential units in the back. We, the developer, Alvaro Sande, is not here today because unfortunately he had to be out of the country. But what we're hoping to do is to see if perhaps we can prevail on this request for proposals and move it in the neighborhood, keep it in the same configuration, keep it in the same historic area. That would put three historic buildings side by side along Portland. And the developer is planning several hundred condos. He calls them mid-priced. Um, and so we think it's a win-win. Um, I do want to tell you that we have a developer who actually cares that that we preserve historic Phoenix. Um, the house is, as he said to me when he came, he said, I get the idea you like this house. <laughs> and I said, yes. He says, I guess I better talk to you about preserving it. And I said, yes. Um, the house has not really been remodeled since 1920. It means that the inside of it is absolutely gorgeous. The developer has offered to pay for the move. We have two bids so that it can be moved. Um, and we have talked to Historic Preservation, who, by the way, are wonderful. And what they tell us is, is that they need a place for us to move it to. <laughs> so that's what we're looking for next. I would urge you to add to the criteria, although I think it's part of the city's plan, the Historic Preservation piece. Are there any questions? And I would just like to add that um, although we have submitted plans for commercial use, we also have a backup alternative for residential use. And we would definitely love moving forward to make sure that we are in collaboration with the local communities in Evans Churchill and Roe Ma. We would love to make sure that we're bringing something to the community that they see a value, um, as well as preserving this house. And just a fun tidbit, there are four different ways to remove carpet glue from 100-year-old <laughs> maple wood floors. So um, we just would like you to keep and Rebecca knows every one of them. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, okay. So, uh, read the card. Thank you so much. Read the cards. Do we have a motion? I'll make the motion to uh, move this forward to council, noting that you are going to come around and uh, perhaps revise uh, the point system. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Now on to item seven, parking meter program changes. This is for information and discussion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and subcommittee members. Welcome back. Uh, when you uh, had one of your last city council meetings, you all approved um, some changes to our parking meter enforcement hours and also authorized um, us to move forward with some dynamic pricing later on in the year. And we wanted to just give you a, a quick update as to all of the things that, uh, that we've worked on since the time uh, you adjourned and uh, programs in place and beginning, and we've got uh, much more to go. We're collecting a lot of data to help us uh, figure out what the next steps are going to be. But we have uh, Mr. Dobelina is here and Tom Godby from Street Transportation Department. They'll uh, run through a quick update for you and be glad to answer any questions or uh, look into anything you'd like us to. So thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Council Members, uh, we have a presentation for information only and we have Tom Godby, our Deputy uh, uh, Director for our department, that's going to go over the presentation. Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chair and members of the subcommittee. Um, this presentation is essentially an update um, and progress to date since uh, council approved the changes in June 18th of this year. 
since then, we've done a lot of public outreach. Uh, we've updated our website. We put frequently asked questions on our website to try to anticipate some of the concerns and questions that the public would have about this new uh, parking program. Uh, we, there were several students at the council meeting that had concerns, so we've had two meetings with the ASU faculty and the students uh, to address their concerns, which we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. Uh, since then, in the past month, we've also installed about 600 new credit card capable parking meters in addition to the ones we already had. That puts our inventory for credit card capable meters at about 1,500 in the downtown area, which represents roughly about 80% uh, of our inventory where people can now swipe a credit card and make it easier as a payment option. Uh, we've conducted several parking studies downtown over the summer, uh, focusing on typical weekdays, what the parking situation is like, uh, Diamondbacks games, Suns games, et cetera. Uh, we'll be doing uh, in, the, this, in, the, in the coming weeks with, with the sun season starting just so we have a better idea of what the parking occupancy is and so we can um, set our pricing accordingly to the, that data. Uh, we did extend our enforcement hours a couple weeks ago on August 18th. Um, that's the week, uh, throughout the week and the weekend, we now have 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, enforcement. Uh, the rate during phase one, which we're gonna continue phase one, uh, Again, we started it August 18th and continue that through mid-November. We're going to maintain the $1.50 rate, uh, so that's not going to change, uh, except we are going to lower the rate at some of our meters, about three to 400 meters. We're going to lower uh, to a dollar an hour, and those are our coin meters to make it easier for people who um, pay with coins and some of the outlying areas uh, to be a little easier uh, because they don't have the opportunity to pay with a credit card. Again, enforcement is 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. daily. And what we've done with our phase one uh, program is do some extended hours on, uh, during the evenings to accommodate, accommodate some of the bars and restaurants. And we've contacted a lot of those uh, uh, businesses to see what works best for them. And a lot of them prefer the two hour parking in the evening. Uh, we're doing four hour parking at a ballpark. Uh, so people want to park at a meter, although there are other options, but if they choose to park at a meter, they can swipe a credit card for up to four hours. So when they're in a the game, they don't have to worry about uh, any additional payment. And then we, we did some six hour parking near the ASU campus to accommodate some of the student concerns. Yeah. Uh, uh, with excuse regard. me. Yes. When you extended the parking hours, do they still pay the dollar and a half times two times four times six, or is it yeah, a dollar and a half? It's a, it's, yeah, it's per hour. Wow. So, yeah, so if it's a two-hour meter, they would have to pay $3. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, part of our public notification. You may have seen the uh, dynamic message boards we put up around town. It was very important to us that we notify the public what we're doing. We, in addition, we put up about 50 or so static signs throughout the downtown area, primarily as people enter downtown, so they know what those changes would be to the enforcement hours. Um, with this, we had to modify a lot of the signs uh, that we have for our pay stations as well as the stickers on our meters. So we've pretty much gone through our entire inventory and made those changes to reflect um, the change in hours. So um, as we go into phase two, we'll be doing some additional adjustments to some of our signs and stickers in the downtown yeah. area. One, one more question, Council. Yes. Do we, oh, uh, Councilwoman. I'm sorry. The sticker, it says limit one hour except two hour limit? Yeah, because we're, we're yeah. <laughs> well, there are certain times when you can park for two hours during the, the day for the business use. We limit that to an hour, but in the evenings and on weekends, uh, people want to go to the restaurants. We give them extra time. Because of that particular st sticker. <laughs> we're, we're trying to address, you know, the needs of the businesses. Um, because some of them don't want the two hours during the day because that's too long. They want the turnover during the day. But in the evening, they want the longer period of time where people can park. So I know it gets a little confusing, mm -hmm. but we're, we're trying to address the needs of the businesses. I'm more concerned about what it, this, the, the communication as opposed to the change in hourly limits. Um, I mentioned the website. We did update our website with all our uh, new information, uh, again, with uh, 
mapping and frequently asked questions, and we'll be updating this over time as we get more questions from the public. Uh, with regard to downtown ASU, uh, there were some concerns at the uh, over the summer with regard to our, our changes, and a lot of students were concerned about paying as much as $6 an hour, which they would not have to pay. Um, the, the maximum rate in the area near the campus would be $4 an hour, and uh, we're not quite certain if we'll even get to that point uh, because they're not near a special event venue, so it's not likely that they'll get a lot of, they'll, have, they'll be paying rates that high in that particular area because it's away from the ballparks. Um, they were concerned about fluctuating rates. Students are concerned that, you know, they don't want to pay $4 one night and $2 the next night, and they, they wanted more consistent rates, which we think we can certainly uh, accommodate that request. Um, because a lot of students do go to class in the evening and, and they may have classes for up to three or four hours or longer and, and may want to stay downtown later, we are accommodating uh, the meters in the area near the campus with longer time limits, up to six hours, except in some, near some of the bars and restaurants. Uh, they wanted to keep the two-hour limits uh, for those businesses. Students also had concerns about uh, dark areas. If they're going to be using meters and lots uh, near the campus, they were concerned about their personal security, so uh, they gave us a, a list of locations where uh, we could improve the street lighting, and we made those improvements and contacted APS to make some additional uh, improvements in the lighting. Uh, the, the parking, the, the meter parking, makes up a, actually a very, very small percentage of the parking available to students, less than, actually less than 10%. Uh, the students do have ample spaces uh, in the ASU lots and garage, about 1,100 spaces. There's uh, an abundance of free on-street parking in the area within four blocks. We have found there's at least 500 free on-street parking spaces that the students are currently utilizing. Uh, the convention center has offered 2,400 spaces to, the, to ASU to, to use for their students. Um, so uh, we think there's plenty available parking for them, and, and a lot of it in close proximity. What we, after the two meetings we had with ASU, we did come up with an agreement to uh, deal with some of their concerns. And one thing that we uh, thought would be beneficial to them to address their concerns is to freeze the parking rate for the first few months of the program at $1.50 an hour. And we'll be doing studies in the area to see if there's some justification for raising that. But I think for now, we thought it was best that we uh, give them a consistent rate and, and let them, uh, and then we're, we're going to go back and meet with them and discuss any potential increases in the rates near that area. Again, we mentioned the six hour evening parking, that's for uh, Monday through Thursdays during the class hours. Um, when the Biosciences Garage opens at Fifth Street and Fillmore next year, uh, the city will make additional spaces available to ASU if they choose to. Uh, uh, do to accept those for additional parking for students. Again, I mentioned the street lights. We repaired 32 of them, and uh, some of the additional ones we report to APS for to be uh, fixed. Dynamic pricing. Um, that's the phase two of the project. Um, we're again, we're everything is driven by data, so we're going to continue to go out and collect parking occupancy, occupancy data to justify the pricing that we set. Um, the pricing, the dynamic pricing, is, is we're going to set that in advance of the special events based on expected attendance. Um, the way this is going to work, the uh, parking meters closest to, to those event venues will likely have the higher rates, and as you get a, away from those venues, the rates will decrease. Um, yeah. uh, sorry. Yes. I, I have concerns about that because I think uh, we need to establish rates during those times so that people know when they come down here, if it's a special event, if it's a certain day, the rate is whatever it may be. But to have that published so that people understand and know when they come down because one day this, next day that, and it could be a different sporting event or whatever. And I just think that's too confusing and it will not um, please the public. Very I don't think it benefits the city. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, that's something we plan to do, put that on our website, try to get out there as soon as possible with information to the public on what the pricing would be. Um, 
I, I, hearing you say that, are you saying that uh, a diamond's back game could be one and a son's could be a different cost? Yes. Yeah, so we, we would, that. yeah, we would try to, once we know what the events are and what the expected attendance will be, we will certainly try to get that information out to the public what those rates would be for those particular games. And there may be a Diamondbacks game and a Suns game and other event activity going on in the same evening that may justify a higher rate. And we will certainly try to get that information out to the public as soon as we can. So, um, Mr. Chairman and Councilwoman Williams, it's a little bit too early for us to know exactly how it's going to work. Um, lots of cities have used this dynamic pricing model very effectively, but it is complicated because it's not you know, if there's nothing happening next to the ballpark or the arena on a particular day, there's no reason to charge the $4 rate at that time. And so that gets confusing because some people, it's just not consistent. So we hope to put together a rate schedule and a rate system that responds to supply and demand, but yet is also as easy as possible to understand. And we will communicate that. But we intend to come before you and, and explain what that is ahead of time so you can ask us questions and maybe help us with with that communication effort because it is it is a little confusing but they do it all over the US and in other countries as well in in major downtowns with major events so it it is doable it's just for us it's a big change and so uh, the important thing is for us to base the decision making on good solid information and then also make sure that we communicate as simply and as clearly as possible so people don't um, get frustrated. And, and so that, that's our goal, and we're, we're going to work our way very carefully into that. You know, I understand what you're saying, Rick, and I know that many cities have this. I don't know if logistically their sporting events are in the same proximity as ours are, where they're very close together, where they're far apart which can impact the parking. But what, I, what I'm saying is I, I really think that you could not have it so flexible that it changes every time two games there or one game here and one game there. I, I think you have to be uh, able to publish rates that people can expect before they come down because nobody's going to look it up on the computer to see, what have I got to pay for parking tonight? That'll mean they won't come down. And we don't want to stop people from coming downtown. Mr. Chair, I don't usually do this. I don't want to be that I told you so guy, but I told you so. This is, I mean, I think this is why we shouldn't have voted for this. This is why I voted against it, because we've turned it over now. And all I can do is sit here and say, well, if you're going to do dynamic pricing, I hope it goes the other way. Because to me, it's shocking that people are being charged to park up till 10 p.m. Again, reason why I voted against it on Saturdays and Sundays. So I hope that's done. I'm not going to cry over spilled milk. But I would ask if you're doing dynamic pricing, you ought to have a lot of hours on Saturdays and Sundays where, sadly, there's not a lot going on down here that we shouldn't be charging people uh, to park. Um, and, you know, I mean, charging someone to park at 9 o'clock on Sunday is just laughable to me. But this, a majority of this council voted to give staff that authority. So, Mr. Chairman and Councilman Gates, uh, you're exactly right. As part of dynamic pricing, we also will be lowering pricing in many areas. And we may even come back and decide that, that you know, in certain hours, because there's no demand, um, there may be certain areas where we don't enforce at all in the evenings or on weekends. I, I think it's too early for us to tell right now. Um, as somebody who was downtown this Sunday night, I will tell you, there were not very many meters available because there was a big event at Comerica Theater, and Roosevelt Row has certain activities on Sunday night, and the meters were jammed on Roosevelt Row. So there, you know, you just don't know. Yeah, and again, Mr. Chair, yeah, and I mean, I, I certainly hope, again, this is what we have now, I certainly hope that we're looking at that, and I agree. If there's an event going on, uh, you have that authority, you were given that authority by the council and to charge a higher rate. I can understand that. But for those times when there aren't things going on and where some of the businesses would love to, you know, have patrons there. And again, you know, I talked about this before for District 3 folks, 
to Councilwoman Williams' point, I don't want people to be deterred from coming to downtown because they think it's $4 an hour when, when it's not. So I think the communication is important. And as much as we can do to communicate that and sort of create some kind of a rhythm that during these periods, it's typically uh, zero, the rate is zero, that, that sure would be helpful. Uh, in a, I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, in addition, we will be conducting public meetings in October to let people know how the dynamic pricing will work. We'll be doing some open houses downtown, give people an opportunity to, opportunity to ask questions and give us some input on how this is ultimately going to work. Uh, this is what the council adopted in June was this rate structure. It does give us the authority to lower rates to as little as 50 cents an hour in, in areas of downtown that may be getting uh, very uh, low occupancy uh, during certain times. So we do have that ability because it, it really um, makes sense to, to charge people much lower rates when the demand is low. So Mr. Chair, just a question about that. So then, in fact, we can, you cannot go below 50 cents an hour? Not with these, uh, Mr. Chair and, and, and Councilman uh, Gates, uh, not with these, these rates are, that's the range that we've allowed, been allowed. And uh, it's again, trying to manage the, the, uh, the downtown. One of the things to add also is one of the challenges that we have prior to making the changes was that when there was a big event on a Sunday morning, let's say there's a marathon, where we would have to bag meters uh, for that coordination, we would not be able without an extended hours and also the, over the weekend to take out those meet, uh, those bags. So one of the challenges that we were seeing was that over the weekend, we would have to, prior to the weekend on a Friday day, uh, enforcement time, we would have to bag those meters and then come back until Monday or possibly Tuesday because there, if it was a Monday holiday, to unbag those meters. So this provides a lot more opportunity for us to manage our parking in the downtown in a better better way. And again, just uh, just looking at the pricing that we have for the ranges, it does allow us to, to go down as 50 cents. Let's say uh, maybe it's a Saturday or Sunday that where that could go all the way down to that, to that price range. And, and Mr. Chairman and Councilman Gates, I think we have the ability to come back to you too based upon the information we receive. And if we if we see that there are certain zones where there's no re either we'll take we also have the ability to take out meters by the way where where we don't need meters at all so there there's some of that as well keep in mind that in this entire area we were up until 3 years ago at a dollar 50 an hour 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. monday through saturday so um, 50 cents an hour on a friday you know on evenings or whatever would be actually reduced from what we used to do so. Well, Mr. Chair, I would hope that you know fairly uh, quickly um, you would you would come back and, and see if uh, you know there is there is some interest because I sure would love to give you all the ability to go down to zero uh, cents and not necessarily the extreme measure of just taking the meter out. I think you ought to have that again since we since we're charging from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. every single day. I think you ought to have that authority to go down to zero. Uh, cents per hour. Thank you. Well, that concludes my presentation. I'm open for any other questions you may Help have. Them. In some other of our peer cities, they have phone apps that will help you understand what the price is and what which spaces are available. Are we? Do you want to, uh, Mr. Chair and and Councilwoman Gallego, we are working towards a a procurement for a pay by phone, for example. And we're working towards that to provide uh, flexibility and, and, and a lot of messaging through through that application. So yes, we're, we're working towards that. But it'd be more than pay by phone, it would also be yeah, information. You to, can you explain a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah, we're in the middle of a procurement right now. And um, what we're trying to do is gather information from the potential vendors on what services they can provide, extending time with cell phones um, to do the actual identification of available meter spaces on a phone or some other electronic de device would require uh, some type of uh, sensing device in the pavement, which is quite expensive. So we're not quite looking in that direction just yet uh, because some cities have put it in and, and they found it was you know, pretty cost prohibitive to maintain sensors in the roadway. So 
at this point, we're primarily looking at the ability to extend the, 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 the time. So if someone's in a meeting or something like that, they can extend their time without uh, concern about getting a ticket. And we will provide information through the phone app about what the rates are in what areas, too, which I think I think that would be very helpful. Questions. The two hours, except when it's not. Right. Is, is, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Confusing. No, I think if you went on the app and you could see, OK, if I park, park four blocks away from the arena, I can get a dollar an hour parking. And if I park next to the arena, it's $4 an hour parking. And I can make that choice. That's that's a very customer friendly approach and I think that both the meters and the meter data and the, the cell phone operators should be able to provide that information. And our meters communicate where someone has paid so you know that this meter is active. Mm -hmm. So couldn't you use right. that instead of sensors in the pavement to know which ones have no one has paid to use? Well, you, what you don't know is whether somebody has pulled away from that space even though it, uh, it has been paid for. Mm -hmm. But I would think that would still be somewhat useful information that yes. would be more cost effective. Or some people I mean, park there and don't it. pay, so that's an issue right. as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at least it would be a little bit more information. We've received some comments from folks who say that we have meters in areas, um, including coin ones that don't have any lighting, where they can't see and read the meter. So there's not overhead lights, and, and so they, at night, are having a hard time paying, seeing. So it's not a safety thing. It's just a physically, the meter is in a dark area, and if I don't have a flashlight, it's difficult, right. so. So just for you and for the public, um, each meter has a number on it. And so if anybody, if people can let us know either the that physical location mm -hmm. or the meter number, I've had people uh, with broken meters, you know, like take a cell phone picture <laughs> and text it to uh, City Hall or send it to, so that let we know that. Let us have your phone number, Rick. Just yeah. text it over to <laughs> Right, <you>. right. <laughs> My wife. Uh, says that all of the meters are broken, but I don't know if I believe that. So, uh, Councilwoman, were you finished? You've got a more? couple more questions. Oh, sure. Um, we also heard from folks who were frustrated that ASU parking garages closed before students were out of classes. Have we made any progress on aligning, helping them also be part of the solution for students? I'm sorry, we were not aware of that, that the garages are closed before mm -hmm. the students. And like the open and these lot are the ASU school. own uh -huh. garages. We can contact them, but we weren't we've aware had, of uh, As we've implemented this, we've had weekly team meetings, including folks from the Downtown Partnership and ASU. So they've been in a lot of our communication activity. And uh, we'll make sure at this week's meeting we let them know about that concern and, and see if they can address that. It'd be great to have their partnership. How many meters will be, one of the things we told folks was that this was to improve circulation and, and make sure that people were coming in and out of meters and help bring more business to downtown. How many meters will be six hour? I would say approximately two to 300 meters. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, in general, um, near the ASU campus area. And then there's another approximately 200 meters that will be four hour. Mm -hmm. And that's all, you know, we can adjust those hours or those durations based on concerns from the public. I mean, none of that is set in stone, so we can always go out and make those adjustments if businesses have specific needs, mm -hmm. um, you know, for their customers. Six hours is longer than traditionally mm -hmm. I think of meters as being the right sure. solution. For and, and again, that was a special case to accommodate the students. Okay. And, and that's only in the evening periods, Monday through Thursday. And what, what we did in that case is we were very careful to talk with the businesses right near the ASU campus. And so as an example, on First Street, just north of Fillmore, right near Cronkite, those meters remain one or two or three hours at night because of the business turnover need. But farther along Fillmore, where there's not a lot of businesses, or uh, it's just mostly students parking there for longer durations, it's less of a problem. So we're, each one of these little areas is kind of a microclimate. We have to uh, manage it in that way, and, and so that's, that's what we're doing. And we're continuing to test and monitor and make adjustments where necessary. So if you get input from a particular business or a particular uh, resident or somebody who visits downtown about something not being logical or not working for them, we need to hear that because that is a way Tom and his staff can make adjustments and make change and make it work even better. That's the whole benefit of having this technology is we have the ability to make 
really easy adjustment. Thank you. Councilman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, agree with Councilwoman Gallego's uh, question and, and request for the ability to pay by phone. It's something that I've been talking about literally for years. Uh, are we, is that something that we're able to do with the current technology or will we need to put new meters in? Uh, Chairman, um, Councilman Gates, we have the, the technology with the meters we have now and the requirement by the successful vendor uh, that's going to provide the pay by phone services will um, integrate their technology with the existing meters so that our enforcement staff, they won't know whether someone's paid by phone or coin or credit card. It'll be seamless. So they're going to push that information to the meter so that uh, enforcement should be seamless, but it's a technology integration that's been done throughout the country. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about uh, concerns with credit card data being breached, and I think there was one today, Home Depot, they were talking about. Do, do we have measures in place um, to protect the uh, credit card data that's being put on these meters? Certainly, the credit card meter Vendors have to meet what's called uh, payment card industry or PCI compliance requirements, and that's a requirement in their contract. Um, we work with the IT department on those issues to make sure that, uh, and, and even through our audits, to make sure that the vendors are current with their certificates for PCI compliance, but it's something the city takes very seriously. Uh, but there are uh, processes in place to ensure that credit card information is protected. And then, uh, Mr. Chair, one more question about, so again, with the dynamic pricing that you're talking about, where where is it on the meters that our residents will be able to tell what the price is at that, at that time? How's that going to be displayed to them so they know when they well, swipe their credit card? There's a digital display, and the price will be right there clearly displayed on the meter when they go to pay. So they're paying based on a number of hours they'd like to park, but the, not, not only the time is displayed, but the dollar amount as well. So as an example, if you went to a Diamondbacks game and you wanted to go to lunch first, and so you got there kind of early, maybe the, the price was $1.50 when you started, and then the price a little later on was uh, $3. Um, you could buy a, a period of time, and it would tell you, it would charge you the $1.50 for your first 30 minutes, let's say, your first hour, I'm, I'm sorry, first hour, and then your other, your next two hours might be at the $3 rate, and it would tell you what the total price would be before okay. you, before you uh, make the transaction. One interesting note that we've already received from the data is despite the installation of 600 new credit card meters, there are a huge percentage of people that still pay with coin. Mm -hmm. So it's a good thing that the meters can take both because there really are a lot, there are a lot of our revenue is still coming in through coins. Councilwoman? We have a great new open data policy at the city. Will we share some of the information about who is using what meters with the public, and then maybe they can help us optimize the system? And I, I would think this is a great data set for an app developer to who could tell you what is the, the most popular area, what are the least popular, and really help us give people the information, because it's frustrating to drive around, and it could be fun to create an app with this. We have some great entrepreneurs in yeah. the Community. Certainly, uh, Chairman Councilwoman Gallego, that's certainly something we can uh, share with the public. We do have heat maps which identify areas that are more heavily used than others, but the data is there. We have a lot of data now uh, with the wireless capability mm -hmm. that we have with our meters, and we're constantly getting that data in, but that's certainly something that we would consider. How would someone who wanted to help us have better parking get in touch with whoever has the data? Mr. Chair and, and Councilwoman Gallego, certainly we can. You can con the person can contact the department, uh, and we can provide that information. Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilman Gallego, we also are getting really close to in the next week or ten days um, to potentially pushing some. Uh, we're, we're focused on early this fall pushing some data out onto our website initially that are going to be open and updated, and so this could certainly be when that actually comes to fruition something we could also put out at the same time in the same location on the city's website. And Thank con you. Connecting the dots with all the open data and exactly what Councilwoman Geigo just mentioned and, and our entrepreneurs as we continue to, to 
create this ecosystem. I think it's very exciting. I think we have some 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 jobs among us and uh, and some great opportunities. So absolutely, I, uh, which is something I'm sure we're going to be talking about in your sub in the subcommittee that you you chair in the fee subcommittee. Um, we do have a couple of cards on this. One person, Leslie Lindo, who uh, is in favor and uh, is available to speak if, if you'd like to speak. Okay, sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. My name is Leslie Lindo, and I'm the Board Secretary for the Roosevelt Action Association. I also sit on the HOA Board for the lofts at Fillmore, which is at 2nd Avenue in Fillmore. And I just wanted to comment that we do appreciate that Streets and Transportation came to the RAA meeting in June and went through all this with us. Um, there was not any complaint from any of the members um, who attended that meeting. We're very excited to see this going on in downtown. It promotes alternative transportation and pedestrian activity, and it also allows the businesses to see the turnover. We have seen folks who were like working at the hotel or attending ASU who would park in the meters all day in front of the businesses. So we're really happy to see that it's actually supporting the downtown economy. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for approving this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dave Kreider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dave Kreider. I'm with Downtown Phoenix, Inc. I think we have two really important transformational things that are going on uh, here, and I think Leslie hit on one of them. Uh, this goes, I think, for the uh, street transportation staff, but also for the CED staff, is the con uh, connectivity into the community and the discussion of these issues with neighborhood and community groups has increased dramatically in the last uh, year or two, and that's really, I think, helping in terms of dealing with these complex uh, issues. So I really do want to thank uh, your staff and Paul also the CED staff for the work they're doing in the community. Uh, I think number two is that we're learning some really important lessons like other cities have from the private sector and dynamic pricing is a way to deal with these robust dynamic uh, situations uh, using a market approach uh, to doing that and I think that that's really important and I think that's helpful going forward. I think we, we traditionally fall into the, uh, the trap of, of thinking about the way we have operated in government as being static uh, in the world is changing so quickly in terms of technology and other issues uh, that having a dynamic approach I think in terms of pricing uh, uses the, those private sector practices and helps us uh, manage the parking downtown. Uh, the other thing I would say is that we're not going to get this perfectly right. And we need, uh, I know going forward, are going to need to make adjustments, whether it's, you know, eliminating a day uh, like a Sunday or a holiday or going from 50 cents, you know, uh, to zero. So we really need to work collaboratively to actively manage the system going forward. Uh, we, through our organizations, have about 80,000 Facebook hits a month. Uh, we have people out on the street every day through our ambassadors program connecting to small businesses, and we want to provide a feedback lo uh, loop to the staff so that as they move forward, they're in a position where they can actively manage uh, the program going forward and not uh, operate as a static uh, type and uh, system or environment. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Dave Craig. Um, okay, so plenty of, of discussion on this. I just want to want to thank city staff, and I appreciate uh, Leslie's uh, words and also Dave Kreider's words. This is something that is going to be uh, dynamic, and and I, I agree. I, you know, Councilman Gates just mentioned, you know, why aren't we, or we should be considering uh, when it's appropriate to move the fifty cents down to zero, and that's the type of discussion we need to continue to have. I just want to remind everyone also why. We're here. I, I use a parking meter pretty often. You know, I, I work downtown also. Um, and in the past few weeks, in the past, I, it's been nice to find a meter that's open. It's also been nice to, because I, I don't have loose change usually. And it's nice to have a meter. Usually it's a meter that takes a card and, um, we, we want that type of technology, and I'm looking forward to the time. I had I met some friends here, uh, some firefighters, some Glendale firefighters here, and of course they're giving me a hard time, you know, uh, because of the, you know, oh, I had to pay, and of course they're exaggerating and they're saying they had to pay, you know. Um, uh, but but nonetheless, uh, they were they were asking about when, when we're gonna be able to, to 
do the thing with the app, and we can't get there without an investment. Uh, we are the sixth largest city in the country, and, and we have to act like it. And uh, let's keep in mind that the, the rates and, you know, of course, we want to, to have the rates as, as low as possible while we are continuing along this mission. Um, uh, but while we're doing that, we're still lower than, you know, than many cities, uh, certainly of the same size in the country, but frankly, many cities right here in this state. You know, there's still, city, we're the sixth largest city in the country. There are cities right here in this state, uh, some of our neighbors that have even higher rates than what we have. And I'm not, I'm not saying that we should catch up. What I am saying is let's just keep it all in perspective. Let's realize that we're on a mission and we're going to be going through some changes. And, um, and many of these businesses, they appreciate the turnover uh, in front of their, their, their businesses as well. They appreciate the fact that we're, we're, we're actually looking at this issue for the first time in many years. So, uh, you know, it's just remembering that this is uh, a dynamic process. It's an ongoing process. And the more feedback, the better, the better the product. And, uh, and so I, I appreciate this. Now, not that I certainly didn't mean to take the last word. If anyone would like to mention anything before we move on. Okay. Well, I re really appreciate the, the information. Okay, uh, the next item is a call to public. We had several cards throughout the meeting. Everyone has had, had an opportunity to speak up. Do we have any other cards? Okay, future agenda items. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the items listed mm -hmm. is the partnership with downtown sports teams. Would that include uh, some type of briefing on the facilities? Because I get questions about the Suns Arena is it getting too old? What's going to happen? Um, I, I'm we, just we, we can, uh, uh, Council Valenzuela, Councilwoman Williams, we, we can brief you all on any subject you want. So okay. um, well, why, don't, why don't we, we'll visit and sort out uh, with, uh, with you and other members of the subcommittee what are the topics folks on this subject would like us to visit about and we can um, and work to get that on a future agenda. Okay. Thank you. Super, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions, comments on the future agenda items? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.